So hi everyone, um, and this this session really is uh, one that is very close to heart to me. Uh, could I just ask if everyone can hear this session already? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this session uh, talks about representation in taxation, and um, I think I'd just like to refer that at the very early stages of talking about tax justice and introducing uh, the need for a greater representation in taxation. Um, we were often told that we were crazy as tax justice advocates to talk about this particular R of representation in tax. Surely tax is just a technical issue and leave it to the experts. I've even been referenced to being uh, a trip advisor uh, type of a commentator when commenting on tax policy of multinationals, um, such as the kind of role of citizens and how we are often seen and treated when we are brought to the tax policy table. Um, however, this is possibly one of the most important uh, aspects of what we advocate as being and defining uh, as tax justice. Um, so just in terms of guidance on this, uh, you know, if, if we have to say, you know, where taxation uh, really needs to look at that uh, representation uh, isn't just about you know uh, being uh, electing representatives to parliament or or having uh, parliamentary committees that look after our taxes citizens also directly need to have access to adequate tax information citizens uh, need to uh, be able to comment on the tax affairs of those who hold power in society, whether it's wealthy people or large multinational corporations. And that requires tax transparency. And it also requires a different kind of citizenship. And, and the very notions of citizenship will be discussed in this panel. And hopefully uh, we will advance new forms of citizenship that will make it more inclusive. Also, there's a role for civil society in taxation, as will be discussed in this panel, and how that is advancing, and how civil society is claiming new spaces and new ways of interacting in terms of accessing better uh, outcomes for all citizens in their very diverse uh, forms, whether women, whether minorities, and in all dimensions of inequality, race, class, caste, etc. And, and that's also why, you know, it's also important to talk about citizens in their plurality and very much diversity and which brings us to um, talking about race and taxation as well. So I think without further ado, I would like to uh, therefore present the first intervention. Um, it is uh, from Yvette Lind. So Yvette Lind is a uh, assistant professor in tax law at Copenhagen Business School. And she holds a JD specializing in international taxation, emphasizing challenges arising from globalization. Over to you. Thank you. I'm just gonna try to quickly share my slides. Perfect. So thank you for having me here. Uh, I am also very passionate about this topic. So uh, I feel very happy to hear that you're also. So what I'm discussing today then is political inequality between globally mobile taxpayers in an era of economic globalization. So this is a part of my ongoing project in which I explore the interlinking between taxation and democracy in the setting of global mobility. So economic globalization and increased cross-border mobility is just coming further and further to do. And due to these uh, cross-border movements, mobile taxpayers may contribute to state finances through taxes, yet, and this may be, of course, in one or several states, depending on their uh, mobility, but they are generally not included in uh, democratic influencing of the, their situation or their tax situation. And interesting enough, states subject individuals to very different treatments. Uh, most obvious example of this differentiation in treatment would be when you compare those who are forced to move on one hand, asylum seekers and immigrants, compared to those who actually are able and or, or even choose to move. So affluent taxpayers still with those who are high income earners or high net worth individuals. So, and interesting enough, states are no longer just competing over corporate taxpayers, they're also competing over human capital. So individual states target individual taxpayers through citizenship by investment programs, or as commonly spoken of, golden visas. And this is a very precar precarious ro road 
for states to pursue as formal citizenship is in, in its essence, the ultimate way for a state to either include or exclude an individual. Hence, it will automatically have consequences on democracy and equality. So one of the obvious examples of these practices would be the case of Malta. They have a citizenship by investment program, which is engaged in order to uh, attract ultra high net worth individuals. So if you are an affluent individual with the funds, you may um, make certain financial contributions and investments in Malta in addition to residing there for one to three years, and you will be awarded a formal citizenship. And with this formal citizenship, a lot of benefits follow, as co of course, not only a second passport, but also the way into the EU through EU citizenship. And this is also why the EU Commission is now currently looking into this practice more closely. The core issue being, is this compatible with the, the upholding of the internal market? Interestingly enough, UK post-Brexit also introduces interesting events for us. They, they have now in, a, introduced a new immigration system, which employs a point system and a so-called global talent visa, meaning that those who already have employment in the UK with a certain level of salary or are considered to be a leader in a specific group, they are welcome. Those without employment or with employment, but with a lower salary are unwanted. I also did this Swedish case study. Previously, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but I'm gonna highlight some of the main findings. So I looked at a bunch of uh, taxpayer groups. You can see them off the left-hand flank here. And then I applied the different legal frameworks. I looked at taxation, access to voting rights and access to social welfare benefits. So if we look at some of these findings, we can see that the benchmark a Swedish citizen is of course then subject to unlimited taxation, meaning they are subject to progressive taxation, mark, uh, an average municipal tax rate of 32%, marginal tax rate of 55%. And of course they have full access to voting rights. They can vote both locally and in the general election. If you look at a different group, immigrant asylum seekers who may need to wait between five to eight years with uh, current processes in order to attain Swedish citizenship. They are residing in a Swedish society. They are also subject to unlimited taxation, full taxation with uh, pro progressive taxation, uh, average municipal tax rate on 32%. Yet they only have, after a certain amount of time has passed within Swedish territory access to local elections. Now, another extreme would be looking at Swedish expatriates. The common uh, example of Swedish pensioners who exit Sweden after they have retired. They usually move down south to the warmth, Spain and Portugal being very popular. Now they are subject to limited taxation. In the best case, they're subject to 25% flat rate tax on their Swedish income, their um, Swedish pension. But in some cases, which is not so uncommon, for instance, the Portuguese case, they will be subject to zero taxation on this pension because in co a combination between domestic legislation and the applicable tax treaty results in double non-taxation. So Sweden is currently also trying to renegotiate this tax treaty because of this event. So they are in many cases subject to zero taxation, yet they have still retained their Swedish citizenship, meaning they have access to general election. And these are just simply examples of how, how modern society in this globalized world order does not really fit into the old frameworks that we are accustomed to. So in conclusion, citizenship is indeed a new tool for tax competition. It aggregates inequality between various groups of taxpayers, most noticeably between those who are forced to move compared to those who actually choose and want to move. So in my opinion, this practice of applying different social contracts to different taxpayer groups dependent on their economic status or and their state of origin needs to be revised in order to strengthen equality, to successfully integrate immigrants in their new societies, and to uphold values of liberal democracy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yvette. And um, I would next hand over to Flavia Patisto de Nascimento, who's an adjunct professor um, at, at Faculdade Senso, researcher of socio fiscal studies group at the uh, University Federal de Goyas and Master and Doctoral Candidate of Human Rights at an Interdisciplinary Postgraduate Programme. Over to you. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, apologize for this. 
Uh, hey everyone, thank you for the opportunity to discuss my paper. This title is the Obscurity of Taxation and Sovereignty of Difference, the impact of COVID-19 on the lives of Afro-Brazilians. The paper intends to elucidate how a structural receipts present the Brazilian tax system produce the vulnerability that intensified the impacts of COVID-19 on the Afro-Brazilian population. The effects of pandemic are different for white people and Afro-Brazilians. Afro-Brazilians who die more for COVID-19 in the country. And when you evaluate the rates with the cross of race and education, the difference is even more accentuated. 8% of death rates for Afro-Brazilians with no education against 9% for white people with higher education. Social inequality has a direct impact on deaths. To understand the context for the perspective of human rights, we use two explanatory frameworks of modernity, the studies of race and the new fiscal sociology, sociology, which have brought race and taxation close together. On the other hand, critical student ways point out that it imagined as a primary category in the development of specific pattern of power, which shapes sexuality, gender, international relations, the world of work, and the very production of subjectivity. On the other hand, a mirror research for the new fiscal sociology showed the relationship of taxation to the operation of already existing oppression and has asserted the following points. The tax system has an economic human from its residual operation. It has subordination the status of human in the apparatus of tax structure has been the same to maintain white supremacy from the mechanism of the racial tax state. In Brazil, race and figure in different moments of historical rupture. Whenever understand the significance of race in Brazilian story is not the same as affirming that alone produce inequality. The category race disappeared from the laws, but its political and ideological effects influence the performance of the state activity. The tax structure must be understood historically in relation to its determinants. The path of accumulation, the stage of development, the role of the stage of the economic and social dimension, and the correlation of social and political force active in the system. This is strong evidence that tax policies play a central role in distribution of wealth and production of inequality. The Brazilian tax burden marked by the participation of indirect taxes. Between the years in 1891 and 1964, Brazil maintained a major incidence of its first extract, uh, extraction on intellectual taxes and foreign trade exports. This context is strongly marked by the maintenance of the regressive character of tax burden. Uh, its social character is still maintained. It is a historical universe that, that has produced the condition to amplify the contamination death through pandemic in Afro-Brazilian population. Whenever to capture who this relationship produces, it's necessary to elucidate the zone of invisibility produced by it. After all, the tax system do not, does not act autonomously to produce these problems, but to extent that it's operating by people who are themselves affected by the political and ideological effects of racism. The universality of the 1988 Brazilian Constitution points to, to inclusion and fiscal sustainability as the nomination policy and value. Whenever was in question the effects of tax, of tax design coupled with racial inequality, the death toll of its country demonstrated that there is some coincidence with social disparity contrary to our supposed dominating political, political value. Uh, the Brazilian state has not managed to reduce privilege or transform itself into a distributive state. Even the educator of the individual icon showed that in our recent period, there is some instability in the concentration of icon on the total level higher than inter international standards. Uh, this social contract before requires elaboration that not only balances the different political forces, but expresses the inequality we accept and those we reject. This fighting should be interpreted for the need to materialize human rights, particularly the right to life, require mainstream the genuine change of economic condition. For this, finance support is needed to change the indices of poverty that have characterized the social context of the Afro-Brazilian population. Any change in the constants require a real change in the distributive capacity of the state. 
a new fiscal model and a political concert regarding state finance. Whenever international research shall be changed to reduce inequality were all impossible in catastrophic situations. Outside of the context, the need for articulation of different policies in the use of tax is decisive in the fight against social inequality. Whenever it is not possible to, redu to reduce inequality with economic growth alone, such the distributed conflict itself, such by the international design of society, the institutional design of society, does not change with simple rhetoric. Uh, the COVID-19 did not inaugurate the socioeconomic difference in Brazil. It only made it more evident. Inequality in Brazil has multi-dimensionality, multi and at the same time, it has constant effect on specific profile more intensely the Afro-Brazilian population, especially the black people. The fundamental question is how right are formulated. This allows us to go beyond creating conditions of protection. In fact, it challenges the circumstances that have produced our challenges. In other words, we cannot limit ourselves to mere regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavio. Um, I'd like to just remind the audience to also look at the live discussion button, which you can find at, I think, the bottom right-hand corner. And there you can uh, make questions to the panel, which we'll take all together at the very end of our round of speakers. And next speaker will be Leonard Wanyama, who's coordinator at the East African Tax and Governance Network. Uh, he's got a varied experience in terms of development, governance, international relations, having collaborated and worked at the Royal United Services Institute, Nairobi Law Monthly, Nairobi Business Monthly, as well as lecturing on international relations at Technical University of Kenya and Riara University. Over to you, Leonard. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Marty. Um, unfortunately, my day started uh, with the taxes not working for me. And you probably might have noticed I disappeared a bit. We had a bit of a power outage. Nonetheless, uh, I'd like to just read through my presentation. That way we could um, go through it quickly. Uh, our study has been titled The Revenue, Obligation, Revenue Obligations and Civics in East Africa a human rights-based approach to tax justice. Um, by way of introduction, the East Africa Tax and Governance Network is a collective of individuals and um, civil society groups uh, that are interested in taxation and they believe it's fundamental to social justice and development goals. We work through public policy, advocacy, research, and capacity building. Many a times we are asked why aren't we the East African Tax Justice Network. And the answer to that is our activities and our membership seek, seek to link this up to other aspects of the revenue cycle. That is uh, questions of uh, revenue allocation and revenue expenditure. And so based on our strategic plan, we have been very keen on trying to find a simple language that would help uh, membership to understand tax justice issues much more easily. This is because when we speak about issues like tax avoidance, round shipping, treaty, treaty, uh, treaty shopping, those are quite far off from the budget. And so while the four R's of taxation, which are revenue, redistribution, repricing, and representation, uh, and maybe if we add on the fifth one by Richard Murphy, which is uh, organization, when we add this, this somehow tries to help the conversation, but nonetheless, it's still very far off because sometimes when you talk about taxes, they believe you're talking about the budget and how things should be allocated. Um, and so in writing this paper, drawing straight from our strategic plan and its activities, we focus mainly on the social contract and trying to show that we must move beyond the sense of democratic sensibility where our activities, our rhetoric are all about a sense of fairness to what I'd call a logic of allocating responsibility. Now with the social contract, we then say then maybe we have a six R which would then be tax justice as reciprocity. 
And so on the one hand, you have the expectations of the and the needs of the taxpayer, uh, which is then justice to the public. But on the other, you have the question of compliance to taxation requirements, which I might couch as justice to government, based mainly on uh, Article 29 of the African Charter on Human Rights and People's Rights, uh, where it talks about individual citizens and their duty to pay taxes. But as EATGN, we then reiterate that every citizen has a power to question. Uh, and then that becomes the, the foundation of our conversations. So the study then looks into understanding economic justice. It um, puts this in the perspective, perspective of structural transformation and that the organizations that are part of EATGN are looking to challenge dominant conventional development ideas on sustainable development and so forth. Uh, but in the end, we hope to then give them the ideas of how to enhance their productivity increase incomes and pursue high economic growth. Um, we then highlight about uh, a fair tax system, just generally informing them that this should be about everyone paying a fair amount of taxation according to their, uh, their ability, uh, no revenue leakage, uh, taxes should focus on uh, helping the people and that they should be transparent, accountable, clear and easy. Um, how we then incorporate uh, human rights uh, principles in taxation uh, using the panel model. Uh, we are en enhancing or championing the fact that tax procedures, processes, and conversations should be about participation, accountability, non-discrimination, and empowerment. And lastly, they should all be within the rule of law. So that then uh, espouses the, the panel uh, acronym. Um, we then give implications. What does the panel uh, human rights-based principles mean? What does it imply to government and what does it imply to taxpayers? Um, then we kind of uh, give uh, general uh, descriptions of what these principles mean to both government and the taxpayer. And then give uh, a process in which the organizations could come up with the tax justice program. Um, so in that, we say step one is all about causality analysis, step two is pattern analysis, step three, capacity gaps, uh, step four, identification of priorities for action, and step five, being program design. Um, I will then just try and highlight a slide, the first one being in terms of uh, the pattern analysis. Just one moment. I hope you can all see that. Just expand it. Is that clear? Yes. Yes, so in this case, you see, um, in terms of patterns, we try and kind of uh, show the relationship between the duty bearers who are government and the, uh, the the rights claimers so we we show what government is responsible for and what the citizens should be claiming uh, at another level the document kind of picks examples so in this case we took something that's very dear to a lot of our members which is uh, the relationship between traders and municipalities so it kind of links that if they pay for instance um relevant business licenses, then there's an expectation that there'll be construction, maintenance of roads, and access to the market centers. Um, I think step three being the capacity gaps, uh, referring to the ability for, sorry. Um, I think I've skipped a slide here. Yeah, the, the ability of uh, rights holders to claim their rights and the uh, duty bearers to fulfill uh, those, those, those responsibilities. So in this uh, capacity gaps analysis, we then enable our membership to determine who has the responsibility, who has the authority to carry out these activities, where are the resources and how are they going to be allocated and maybe spent and managed, who is the decision maker and the kind of communication that may be needed to take place in order to 
for them to understand uh, how their taxes are working for them. Uh, this is just a simple mapping of uh, those perspectives based on the responsibility, authority, resources, and decision making plus communication. And lastly is uh, step five, where it is uh, identification of, sorry, step four, identification of uh, priorities for action based on their importance, their feasibility and their urgency. So essentially this kind of links up to the larger budget conversations that take place. And then step five in terms of uh, program design, where they are now looking at how they will be plugging into those conversations to actively try and influence and inform in whatever way possible. So whether it is act through active citizenship, so for instance, um, if they want to conduct protests or do uh, theatrical performances in that relation, but we have kind of guided them through uh, what, what it means and how tax relates to the other budget aspects or the re revenue cycle so that they know how they can be informed. And it links up to their um, familiarity with human rights discourse in thinking about uh, tax issues. Now, one other aspect we added, of course, because of the COVID situation was just to kind of highlight the question of uh, emergency context. Um, of course, uh, being in the region that we are in, uh, particularly in the East Africa region, before even COVID happened, we had a locust, uh, in, uh, locust invasion. Uh, so we are in a region in which there are going to be lots of these uh, catastrophes uh, related to climate uh, and so forth. So, and even just maybe there might be need for a discussion about uh, what are emergency contexts and then how are we going to be taxing uh, or operating in terms of taxes in just dealing with those issues. So there's a whole conversation in that, but essentially the underlying principle here is that uh pandemics catastrophes emergencies do not uh, invalidate or cancel the responsibility the responsibilities and duties that are around taxation uh however it kind of informs the kind of considerations that are needed so for instance this in kenya we had an issue of uh, suspending um uh, taxes for a while and we had some reliefs but how do you bring that on board? How do you uh, get people participating so that uh, uh, they are more involved in taxation? So we have a number of recommendations going forward after this. Um, after this study, we'd like to do a lot more in terms of uh, looking into how uh, tax authorities in the region are um, inculcating human rights-based approaches in tax administration partnering with these authorities so that um, we can uh, inform more people about the questions of taxation, uh, carrying out uh, studies on tax justice, more so in relation to uh, gender perspective, and also just engaging in uh, activities about tax morale. Uh, we are in a serious uh, debt context. Um, so how do we have that conversation, understanding that there will be uh, tensions, there will be instances of a lot of balancing acts, dealing with debt, dealing with service delivery, and how do we do that? So mainly in terms of research, those are the main recommendations. In terms of communication, we need a lot more research um, in just on human rights and how it links to taxation, particularly if not a qualitative side, but also quantitatively. Uh, there needs to be more dissemination, more policy dialogues. And then uh, lastly, it's just uh, about training. So working our way towards uh, a civic education uh, approach to taxation, so that this is something that is uh, very well inculcated in our societies, which uh, based on our mandate is within the East African community. Uh, and that's where we hope this study will have the most impact in influencing policy uh, makers and uh, the populace at large. Thank you, Marty. Thanks, Leonard. Uh, I think we can all learn from a human rights-based approach to uh, implementing tax justice work uh, in all of our spaces. And 
Next and last uh, speaker in this panel will be Dr. Maria Ron Balsera. So Maria Ron Balsera works at ActionAid as a Tax and Education Alliance Coordinator, a partnership that brings together ActionAid, Education International, Global Campaign for Education, Tax Justice Network and the Global Alliance for Tax Justice. Um, and uh, she also holds a PhD in education from Germany and um, has a, an extensive academic uh, experience as well. Over to you. Um, there you go. Okay, hi. Hi, everyone. And thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to, to present in this great conference. So our presentation, and I'm presenting also on behalf of my colleague, Johannes Kimilia, who is based in Mozambique and unfortunately has very unreliable internet connections. So sorry that he cannot be here today. So I'll be presenting on his behalf as well. So what I'm going to be presenting is this Reflection Action Toolkit. This is an updated version of something that we had done some years back. And it is currently available in English, Portuguese and French. And we are translating it uh, at the moment into Spanish as well. And this is a really good example of what we do and Action Aid's uh, approach, like human rights-based approach, because it links uh, the work that we do at international, national, and local level. And this is very much about raising awareness of, at local level, which is what one of the strengths of Action Aid, because it's a very much a grounded organization and we work with local partners. And this is a participatory approach in the way that this is a participatory research and raising awareness, respecting and building on people's existing knowledge, supporting community on conscientization processes, so it's very much freer, and helping people to strengthen their capacity to communicate in whatever form is more relevant and desired to them. And with this, we promote comprehensive power and rights analysis, and particularly a gender analysis of power and this one is particularly on tax justice. So as I said before, this is an update of an earlier version and it incorporates comments and reviews of the initial a reflection action toolkit on tax justice. And this is a collection of 24 participatory tools to learn and act on tax justice at different levels. And some of them are particularly tailored to some groups. So why do we need this reflection action toolkit? We think that it is best like to simplify the understanding of taxation, um, particularly gender responsive public services, its connection and tax justice in general. That can seem a very abstract concept when we are talking to people uh, in the community. Very often when you say, how many of you pay taxes? Most of the people won't, won't raise their hands because they consider themselves as not being taxpayers. They, are, they always think that you are working in informal work, you are not a taxpayer. So when we start asking, so how many of you, for instance, buy bar soaps or buy this lab? And when they start raising their, their hands, we say, well, so you are a taxpayer because you are paying sales taxes or VAT. And because you are paying taxes, this is, is empowering because we link it to the accountability that the government needs to have. And we link it to issues of like, being like right holders and the government being a duty bearer and their government responsibility to provide public services, right? So it is very important to build this knowledge and this empowerment when you are uh, demanding good quality public services, if you link it to taxation. And I will mention at the end some really uh, like some success stories that are really very empowering in that sense. So it is about facilitating an easier knowledge sharing among various economic agents in a manner that is not too technical, but assists in understanding of technical use of on taxation. Uh, as I said, some of the tools, and uh, very much there are 24, uh, are a design uh, bearing in mind like specific groups. So for instance, for students and teachers, one of my favorite is ideal school. And I don't know where you can see a little like, you know, diagram here in terms of like, what's the school missing and who should be paying for that. And perhaps you wouldn't be surprised that most of them say either the family or NGOs and government doesn't need to be paid for anything. And that's because we have broken this accountability, you know, this social contract of I pay taxes and I get public services in exchange. And 
because there are so many gaps in public services. In the end, the NGOs have become this, like they have been doing this service delivery. So they just expect schools and health facilities to be built by NGOs, right? And we do the same in terms of like how many of you send children to private schools and with this idea of like paying twice you are paying for the, the public school which should, should be free and then you're paying for private schools so and that's that has been again really really powerful then there's another tool such as the market mounting for for farmers about like the different taxes that they have to pay whenever they are just selling their products like the type of harassment that they might get same for vendors there are some specific on women about raising um, awareness in terms of the of gender uh, power dynamics. And um, there are some specific for young people that again have been very successful, such as the tax pay for photo, and then just sharing it in social media and the local tax indicators, for instance. So in terms of the, um, of the different sections of the uh, Reflection Action Toolkit, uh, they, they, the focus of this is just the, the tools cover issues related to the role of governments and to a lesser extent to the role of companies in tax justice, but it also brings up this, these issues, particularly in the role plays. And there are some main discussion points on taxes paid for public services. Most of us are taxpayers. The richer should be paying relatively more tax and the poorer less in terms of the progressive taxation. And foreign companies often do not pay their fair uh, share of taxes and what implication this has in terms of the, the amount of money that the government has to provide for public services. So section one, uh, one sorry, uh, focuses on the local problems of, on tax, and I'm not going to explain to you what progressive taxation should be, but uh, we also uh, use like so like cartoons and some like different representations, and in terms of the tools, we we use for instance stones or, or matches to represent like how how much like how resources uh, or salary some people would have, or sorry, income people would have, and how much they would be paying, and the difference between a progressive taxation system and a regressive one. And in terms also of corruption, and there are different tools to, to share knowledge and to, <clears throat> to raise awareness. Section two links the local pronouns uh, with public services. And uh, again, it, it talks about particularly education because that, that's, those are the projects that I have been normally coordinating, but also about health and other public services such as lightning, etc. <clears throat> and um, so these are these are some of the examples of the tax base for uh, photos that we have had and some of the problems that they identified. And the third section links national and international uh, roots of the local problems. And basically, it, it just tries to demythify this concept of government not having enough money and just being this serious ser sum um, <clears throat> in which that if you take more of the share of the budget for education, it should be taken away from the health, etc. And it's about increasing the size of the budget. So this this again, normally is a very abstract conversation, but because of these tools, we are able to, to communicate this in very simple language, very accessible. And again, it's very empowering for the people who are there and are able to, to go beyond just identifying the problems and just living with it, to actually mobilize, to advocate for better services on the basis of being taxpayers. And in terms of the success stories, I'll be sharing some with you when I log into the, into the other platform. Uh, we have a really, really nice one, particularly from Pakistan, that it is actually documented in a, in a short video about some people that after using this reflection action toolkits decided to go and start um, collecting all the data of how much people were paying on VAT on just cigarettes in their community and actually adding it up and with that amount, they said, okay, so only just in cigarettes, we have been paying this amount. And the local school 
wasn't working, that was in Tata in, pa in Pakistan. And it was just in such a state of disrepair that it was not safe for the students to go there. So they went to the local uh, officials, the local authorities, and they said, this, this school is you not know, functioning because of uh, you know, <laughs> the, the state of disrepair. And they said, oh yeah, but it costs so much money. And they said, this is how much money we are paying. And you cannot tell us that this is not paying for that. And because of that, actually the government committed the local government committed to, to prepare the school and they did, and now the, the children are able to go to that school. So this is just an example of how raising awareness can actually have this function of like, you know, mobilizing people and advocating for, for their own rights. And yeah, so thank you very much for, <laughs> yeah, for your attention and I'll be sharing all these resources as well with you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, so I will be picking up some questions from the Q&A box. And um, I guess as moderator, I've uh, abused my privilege there to, to make my first question to Flavio and asking, are there some taxis in Brazil that you identify as uh, discriminatory on basis of race? A bit like how feminist activists have identified a tampon tax to be discriminatory and argued it to be zero rated on VAT or, or consumption tax. Or is it a socioeconomic question of where people of colour or people uh, of Afro-descendant background in Brazil are situated? Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, the challenge of fiscal policy in Brazil is that this does not have a racist basis from a legal point of, of view. Whenever it, it is extraterritorial, which is based on all indirect tax, has social and political impacts. Because the indirect tax affect the poorest, the, the vast majority of, of who are black people. Uh, whoever does more political influence can directly influence the fiscal decision. Uh, the tax system is not producing a vacuum, so in order to reproduce race and social inequality, it, uh, it needed to be simpler. We have many rates, it is necessary to simplify and increase the social investment. The tax system is not just about accounting, uh, but it's necessary to think about uh, its political and social dimension. So the tax system is not just, uh, sorry, uh, in, in Brazil, uh, we need progressive tax system because the current model has depend on our social and irrational inequality. Thank you. Thank for you. And I will take the next questions from both Liz and Alex. So Liz is asking, what's your experience analysis on how tax morale, so representation and accountability and tax policy can strengthen the social contract? And how could this work within the informal economy? And Alex, um, so I guess that question is uh, mostly to both Maria and Leonard. And, and then Alex is asking a great range of papers um, He's saying it would be interesting to hear what the presenters uh, say if you see similarities and findings in each other's papers. And, and do you see similar experiences between uh, one another? Um, and and uh, Leonard or Maria, do you, are you ready to answer uh, Lizzie's question about the informal sector? Maybe let me go first, if you yeah. don't mind. Yeah. Um, uh, and also just linking your question in terms of uh, tax morale, I think uh, for us, the, and, and going back to my point about uh, the moving from a democratic sentiment to a democratic logic, where once the responsibilities are placed and it's quite clear who has what duties and who can claim what, then... Um, we then find the citizen at a point of empowerment. So he then has a direct link in terms of if these taxes are uh, asked for at this point, this is my expectation and this is what I directly demand. This is especially if you look at the context of increased devolution across the region. So there is an empowerment uh, in terms of giving them uh, the, the clear patterns of of of, of uh, the, the, the responsibilities that are in place. Um, in terms of just, um, I am finding uh, Maria's study on the reflective action toolkit 
uh, quite similar to what we are doing. I think that would have been the next stage from this, but it's it's good that we have seen this. It's something that we can then start incorporating now in terms of going straight to action, uh, looking through the countries this can apply to and seeing which partners can then combine this, this logic that we're talking about now directly into the action part and how it relates to their context. Thanks. So I cannot really see the question, <laughs> but in terms of the informal taxation, we again have some really good examples, particularly I can think of one in Korea, in Kenya, uh, where the vendors like jo joined together and they refused to be paying the sale taxes that were very like type of informal because again, they weren't like being uh, collected in, a, in an official manner sometimes, but they refused paying until there were some a sanitation facilities in the market. And they, it, it took some months, but they, again, they were able to, to get the change that they wanted and they, there was those sanitation facilities. And also a, a couple of years ago, a, my former colleague Kasia and I wrote a paper about a paying a, for education which is supposed to be free for basic education. All these school payments, uh, to to be in, to be seen as an informal type of taxation, because this is a, that was an inter interesting twist that you might want to, to hear about. Thank you. Um, I'll take the next uh, group of questions. So, again, I'm as a moderator making a small question to Yvette. Um, I I found it uh, fascinating. Um, about uh, the, the idea of fiscal citizenship and how that sort of is different from other notions of citizenship. I guess my question is, what would be the incentives for some countries, you mentioned Malta, to give up on such sort of uh, regimes of um, golden visas or others? Is it only sanctions or are there, if you like, other ways in encouraging? And um, just um, within the Nordic countries, also Sweden is in a sense a tax haven for very wealthy Finns because Sweden doesn't have an inheritance tax. So um, I think we've had some uh, of our, uh, I'm originally from Finland, uh, the wealthiest people moving there uh, for that particular reason. So it also works within countries who you don't think are tax havens, but a, and a lack of harmonization or discrepancy in policy means that one country becomes favorable uh, to another country. And, and a question from Ross, um, and this is, I think, directed to everyone. Uh, which actors do you think are key in shifting wider narratives on tax justice, social contract and accountability? And do you have uh, examples of actors challenging their behavior? Uh, over to Yvette first. Should I start? Yes. Uh, I mean, just as you described uh, that individuals are tax planning and moving between jurisdictions is, is nothing new. And as you say, it's nothing illegal either for a Finn to go over to Swedish side just in order to avoid inheritance tax. I think the new phenomena here is that states are actually targeting individual taxpayers upland ones uh, through citizenship. That in itself is a new incentive for attracting uh, individuals. And that is just a result of citizenship in itself becoming more and more of a value uh, you know, currency in the globalized world order. We have this internal ranking between uh, passports. You've seen how valuable EU citizenship is, Commonwealth citizenship. Even we have even, as you say, the Nordic citizenship, it's much easier for me as a Swede to attain citizenship in Denmark than compared to others. So, I mean, this in itself, when it's being aggravated in this manner, when people are becoming more mobile, just aggravates already existing inequalities between groups. So, I mean, it just becomes even more obvious for immigrants and asylum seekers that it's a very hard situation to be integrated in society. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Um, Maybe the question about the actors are, uh, who are most important, I'd maybe first ask Leonard about that. I mean, when you started with the human rights approach on taxation in East Africa, which new actors did you engage that were not engaged before? And how did that, if at all, change the nature of the dialogue? We're often told by donors and intergovernmental bodies like the IMF that tax is just a capacity building issue of revenue authorities. All we need is to build capacity and it will be fine. So how do you come back at that? Um, first of all, that question actually goes to the heart of the formation of the East Africa Tax and Governance Network. Um, our membership was 
uh, organ civil society organizations that had no relation to taxation at all. And so in that sense, they all came together because they first realized that there is a component of revenues that we have to be engaged in. So the civil society was the first group that came into the conversation. Um, in terms of supporting this group, it was uh, the, uh, which I'd call the second ring. It has been the academics who are then uh, teaching them about the principles, uh, getting them up to date about what's currently happening, what are the debates, uh, even at the local level, internationally, uh, and how they should be thinking around issues. Nonetheless, as I'd mentioned that this comes from a strategic plan, we are looking, about, looking to speak to the faith-based groups because of the, the uh, very broad reach that they have. Uh, but then, of course, because of the different orientation of groups, so for instance, the civil society and the faith-based groups have a very different orientation in terms of how they reach the masses, the one thing that we realized got them together is a human rights-based approach. They both think of these things through human rights. So our target is to speak to them. Nonetheless, again, also because of the context of the region, the political debates, um, constitutional reforms and so forth, government is increasingly listening to what civil society has to say because they realize the connection to human rights and how it is needed in especially issues like service delivery. Uh, a good example in terms of our engagement has been uh, uh, our activities and our partners in Uganda who have built a very good relationship with their, with their revenue authority. Uh, we were recently invited to speak to them and it's something that we constantly see we, we see the revenue authority there like just going out of their way to kind of explain the context. And so that is uh, the space in which uh, things are evolving. Thanks. Thank you. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to answer that on that, on the new actors? Maybe Maria first. You know, it is important to start expanding the who who are the main stakeholders in this. And this is what we are trying to do, to popularize. So, so tax is not just only for technocrats. Tax is not only for the Ministry of Finance. I think that all the other ministries should be knowing where the money is coming from and why the money is not coming mm -hmm. from, you know, for, uh, enough. And, and again, for all the activists, and this is something that we are particularly doing at the Tax Aid Alliance. It's just like linking that, uh, because we really need to increase the size of the budget. And to do that, we need tax justice. We need to do it in a sustainable way, in a progressive way. So yeah, it's about expanding the amount of people who will be claiming <laughs> tax justice. And I have a question about Brazil next. I mean, I remember my first time as, uh, when I was with the Tax Justice Network, we went to Brazil. We were talking to the uh, uni University Hetulio Vargas people about, you know, who were tax professors, and they thought uh, we were quite crazy talking about tax justice. But we found a counterpart in the trade union of tax and revenue authorities, who were the Una Fisco, and of course, uh, many of the social justice advocates who were working on debt and mining issues in Brazil. Do you feel that in Brazil there's a vibrant discussion, or do some of the tools presented on the human rights based approach on taxation? Um, could they be helping to service the, if you like, the discrepancy of tax policy discussion in Brazil that you mentioned, Fabio? Uh, in Brazil, the big challenge is to discuss uh, how the system, the tax system is construed, uh, is built. Um, in, in the moment, uh, we leave you. Uh, the most of the crisis in Brazil, uh, with pandemic, all of, all of this. In the 19, in 2016, uh, when uh, the government construed one uh, uh, other tools of uh, about uh, fiscal policies, in, in the moment, uh, the the big challenge is uh, see the other form, uh, the political fiscal uh, discuss about uh, what. How a society we accept, you know, how your inequality we accept, it does not accept. Is the, in my opinion, is here is the big challenge for us. Uh, discuss that structure in same time. Discuss human rights. 
discuss all of this, it discuss how a society in Brazil we accept, we we want. Right? And so the, the reality the point is this how a society in Brazil we want. There's a campaign in Brazil on the wealth tax. Are people being excited about that at the moment? Another step, sorry. Uh, there's a campaign in Brazil about the wealth tax, Imposto sobre riqueza. Is that a, a point where people and social movements are excited? Uh, so, the, the reality the disco, it is necessary. So, um, it's still, uh, and it's step by step with the cost, uh, building the discussion with civil society. So, uh, it, it's a really challenging here. It's, the movement, social, social movement, the academic and civil society discuss what uh, the, public, the political fields could know, know in, in the hand of the government, but it's necessary to discuss with all, with, with the, all political fields because we want. So, this, uh, so, so what the important is the, uh, is the uh, we uh, read the movement sources, uh, discuss all this with civil society uh, beyond the government, say, in the, in the in television, in the notes. Thank you, thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of our panel, uh, the last few minutes. I think, um, this, I'm not going to attempt to sum up everything, but I think if we were to group some of the presentations, the first two presentations by both Yvette and Flavio pointed out how fiscal citizenship has, has its biases and has its inherent biases in the history of the country and in the history of the economy and the place where it has been formulated. And it is by unpacking those biases that we can actually achieve representation that is more uh, equitable and that reaches for greater tax justice and therefore that gives substance to the representation from an academic perspective and from an intellectual perspective that citizenship itself is not adequate we need to look at the fiscal history and the fiscal sociology of the country on the other hand if we look at the second papers by leonard and, and by maria and and also johannes action aid we see how a human rights based approach is making real advances in making it more concrete both at the national regional and the local level in making the way in which citizens participate meaningful and they are aware of their own rights as a result as an end result of that which has a value in itself and that can lead to long-term tax and fiscal policy change that leads to a more just society so I guess that's my two minutes of uh, trying to sum up a uh, broad range of papers. Again, these papers are available uh, on the portal, so you can find and click them there. You can also find the contacts of the authors if you'd wish to uh, send an email and ask a few more questions. And um, I wish you a great next panel.